Welcome to another episode of Pit Lane Parlay. Welcome to another episode of Pit Lane Parlay. My name is host Mike Jokum. My pal Frank Santoroski joins me as we do another Lost Tracks uh, special episode. Uh, this one on Riverside International Raceway. So Frank, how you doing tonight? And thanks for joining again. Oh man, thanks for having me on. I mean, it's, it's, it's a pleasure to do these. You know, I think that there's so much uh, racing history out there that a lot of young people just don't know. So I'm, uh, it just, uh, it pleases me to, uh, you know, just help kind of educate folks, honestly. Yeah, I, I agree. There's some some really cool stuff out there that, you know, like Riverside that uh, that I never saw even on TV, but uh, still really cool to talk about Riverside, you know, known a lot for a handful of IndyCar races, a bunch of NASCAR races, a bunch of IMSA races, a Formula One race, IROC raced here. So uh, that's a, you know, quick little overview. It's a pretty cool looking track. Just uh, it was outside of LA, a couple hours south of Laguna Seca and probably pretty close to Long Beach. So uh, where do you want to start? Oh well, I mean, honestly, if 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 the uh, the movie The Wizard of Oz was about abandoned racetracks, Riverside would be the Scarecrow. Um, <laughs> and why is that? Because because as Dorothy said, Scarecrow, I think I'll miss you most of all, because Riverside was g- genuinely liked. By it was a real drivers' track. You know, the drivers liked it, the teams liked it, the the series that raced there liked it. Um, they they were in a great metropolitan area. They put on a good show. It was very fan friendly. There were there were great viewing angles. So it's I mean it, it's sad that it's gone. That they had a 32 year history. The original owner was a, a guy named Ed Polly. I believe they it was a some sort of a like uh, automobile testing facility kind of company started building the track and they ran out of money and then Ed Polly and some of his backers took over the project and, and they opened the track in 1957. Now Ed was Ed was more of a, a hands-off owner. He the, the president of Riverside Raceway and the director of operations was a fellow named Les Richter and Les is he's a Hall of Fame football player. He played the Los Angeles Rams. He's you know well known in the LA area, but, uh, but a big race guy. I mean, he even had, even had a stint, uh, during his career as the director of race operations for NASCAR. I mean, this guy was, was well-versed in, in auto racing and, and the perfect guy to run the facility. And he, he ran that facility until they changed ownership years and years later. But, uh, but let's talk about the layout of the track. The, um, the track was in its long course, 3.3 miles, nine turns, and there were several different configurations they could make out of that. You know, like some of your, some of the, the club racing facilities you see today where they have, you know, multiple places they can shut off the track. But they had several different uh, configurations they could use. They could run it clockwise or they could run it counterclockwise. Um, they had a, a shorter course. They had a, a half mile oval within the facility there. So there were a lot of different things. Uh, that they could do with Riverside, and it just it it had very long straightaways, very tight turns. In particular, uh, the back straightaway was quite long and downhill, and and at the end of that straightaway was turn nine, which was a 180 degree turn hairpin, and it was uh it, it, it was fast, and I mean you would literally destroy the brakes trying to slow slow down for that thing if you wanted to get your maximum speed on the straightaway, and it ended up ended up being one of the most dangerous part of the of the course as well um now now we could you know we've talked about uh, in some of our other shows about tracks that were inherently dangerous and riverside certainly had that reputation there were in the 32 uh, year history of riverside 21 fatalities including um <laughs> a fatality in their very first race meeting in 1957 you know a, a fellow named John Lawrence went off the track in turn nine and, and through the wall, and then he, he died about two days later of, of the head injury. So, and then over the years, I mean, we lost, uh, nearly lost AJ Foyt there in '65, had a horrendous wreck where they thought he was dead at the scene. You know, NASCAR champ Joe Weatherly lost his life there. Uh, Rolf Stomlin, um, the the only fatality ever in an IMSA GTP race happened at Riverside. Rolf Stomlin. And then, of course, Ken Miles. Ken Miles, who is there's a renewed interest in Ken Miles because of the um, the, the new Ford versus Ferrari film, you know, where Christian Bale did a fine job of portraying Ken. He also lost his life testing at Riverside, and 
1966, which was, you know, shortly after the the, the main action of that film. So uh, the, the track was dangerous, but it was a real driver's track, and people enjoyed the challenge. And, you know, events there, the, the NASCAR guys were there as early as, you know, the late 50s, and the very, you know, close to the beginning of NASCAR. NASCAR began in 1949 within, you know, 10 years that Riverside was there west coast um home for for up you know all the way through 1989 before they started uh racing at sonoma you know right to the end of riverside but they nascar would host two races out there they had the what they call the winston west in the early days it was the, the the west before you know winston came on board but a lot of the the regular grand national or you know cup guys would run that one as well uh, just because they like the challenge of the track yeah the you know going back to the layout looking at the back straightaway and using my uh not so good math skills it looks like the back straightaway was just about a mile long which is pretty intense for a road course especially when you're going downhill into turn nine and I'm, I'm, I'm just reading about uh, aj Foyt's brake failure you have to wonder how many guys had brake failures at, at such a point when you're going 160, 170 miles an hour down to a 180 degree turn. Yeah. And now they did in the late I want to say after 1967, after another fatality at turn nine, they did reprofile the turn. They put a little bit of a, a dog leg out there and they actually widened uh, the turn to make it a, you know, a little safer, but you know, then, but they still, you know, lost uh, Ralph Stallman there a after the, they reprofiled the turn. So it was a bit of a dangerous area. And, but, uh, you know, every track's got that, uh, that, that, that spot that's just tough and it's difficult. And if you, if you can master it, you know, you're, um, you're doing very well. So another interesting thing about Riverside was because of its proximity to Los Angeles, it was often used for, for movies and television and to film commercials. You know, they film tons of car commercials. You know, you always see the, the car commercial with, you know, professional driver on a closed course. Well, Riverside was the place to do that. And, and there are a bunch of motion pictures uh, where, where scenes were filmed there. And a lot of times, like any TV show where you needed a car chase, they, they dress up the, the back straightaway to look like a freeway and film a car chase there rather than closing down you know, streets in downtown Los Angeles. So it's, it was very much used. And one of the things, when I was a little kid, you know, one of the, the first movies I really liked was the original Herbie the Love Bug. And there are a bunch of the racing scenes that her, at, in Herbie were filmed at Riverside. And they, they even, they mentioned the track several times, you know, oh, we're going to get the big race coming up at Riverside. So, it, you know, it's, it's, it's widely used in popular culture, Riverside is, just, you know, based on its proximity to Los Angeles. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking at the movie and TV list here. Uh, first off, the original Harvey the Love Bug is fantastic, uh, and I'm pretty sure I owned that on VHS for, for many years. Chips, the TV show, was there. The awesome TV show, Knight Rider, shot there. What else do we have? Grand Prix, the movie, was shot there in 66, and a bunch of other stuff. But yeah, uh, pretty pretty cool that it was used so often, and you know that back straightaway was so long they could dress it up as a as a highway for, you know, different TV shows and movies and whatnot. Yeah. Here's another interesting Riverside story that, that some folks may not know. Did, did you realize Sweet Savage was discovered at Riverside? No, I did not know that. It's a, it's a fun story. Um, now, Riverside is known as the house Dan Gurney built, right? Because, number one, Dan yeah. Gurney, Gurney won a lot of races there, but, but Dan would – Oh, he used Riverside a lot for testing his cars and whatnot. He was uh, he was a regular fixture there at Riverside. And Riverside itself was used just in car testing a ton. I mean, you're talking uh, – here's a track that because of, number one, the favorable weather, uh, and number two, just the different configurations. I mean, this track was, was booked almost every off weekend that they had from racing for testing. It was, it was highly used. I mean, it was always a busy place. But uh, Sweet Savage was um, – Young guy, he was uh, he he had done some automobile racing, but he was more of a motorcycle guy. Really, he was a motorcycle racer. He was actually part of the Evil Knievel stunt show. He would warm up act for Evil Knievel, come out and do uh, do some tricks on his motorcycle. So he caught wind of the fact that Dan Gurney was going to be there in Riverside, and you know, Sweet Savage, he's a California guy. He didn't live far. He figured he just he just show up at the track, right? So he so he shows up. I, I guess security was pretty lax. He just you know came on in and he was 
driving up and down the pit lane on his motorcycle, popping wheelies and showing off, I guess trying to draw some attention to himself. And it worked because uh, a fellow named Monty Roberts, who was uh, a PR guy with Ford, you know, kind of kind of noticed him. And then he says, wow, man, that guy, number one, he's just it, it, a lot of natural charisma, good looking guy, uh, you know, brave soul doing his wheelies here. So he opened up a conversation with him. And before you know it, he was signed signed a contract as a Ford driver. And a couple of weeks later, he's, he's, he's running Holman Moody's car uh, in NASCAR down in um, down in Martinsville. So, uh, and, and, you know, and then from there, you know, Swede worked with Dan Gurney for a while, as well as, uh, you know, his career in, um, in the USAC. So uh, just interesting, you know, because everyone's there at Riverside, Swede decided to show up and got himself noticed. So that, that's always a neat story of like. Yeah, that's pretty cool. I, I did not find that in when I was doing my research here, but it looks like, uh, you know, I'm going to go back to the layout again because I'm, I'm curious to get your input here. Looking at the, the, the redesigned layout where they widen turn nine, I can, I can see that. It kind of looks like an early predecessor to what is or you know, was Sonoma Raceway or whatever they call it nowadays uh, with the you know, kind of wide turn nine, kind of a windy, you know, tight, windy section turns six, seven, and eight, almost, uh, you know, the, the turns two, three, four, and five, where it's uh, kind of like the S's, but but not quite. Uh, any any thoughts there? Am I completely right, or am I, am I way off base? It, it does bear some similarity to Sonoma, for sure. Uh, I mean, the whole layout, and, and you can see, if you look at a track map, that, that it shows you the old turn nine and, and the new turn nine, where they added kind of a, a little bit of a kink before the turn to widen it out. But, uh, you know, Sonoma has that, uh, that, that hairpin at the end of the straight. And, you know, sometimes it's used, sometimes it's not. It, you're able to do a configuration where you kind of shorten that. I, I believe IndyCar has used the shortened one in the past. NASCAR prefers to use the full hairpin there. But, yes, it, it's a very similar uh, in, in look to it, very similar with the, uh, the amount of elevation changes. I mean, the thing that you can't always tell just on a track map is the amount of elevation change. And, you know, again, that. Riverside had a lot of elevation change, and that back straightaway was downhill all the way, you know, and then and then around the turn and back uphill. Very similar to like uh, the boot at Watkins Glen, where it's got the downhill tight turn and then back uphill. So again, very very challenging turn for the drivers. I love it. That sounds uh, that sounds awesome. Was the elevation change similar to say? maybe uh laguna seca and the corkscrew you know where it's almost uh you know 150 feet when when all said and done i don't think it is quite as extreme as laguna's corkscrew i think that's laguna's corkscrew is quite uh unique in in that sense but but there there you know was quite a bit of elevation change at uh uh, at Riverside, I would say it's it's kind of similar to uh, like a Bridgehampton, which is it's another lost track, but the, the the elevation changes were similar to that. Or again, like I said, to Watkins Glen. Awesome. Uh, and you know, jumping and looking at specifically the USAC years, and then which was in the late '60s, and CART years, which was in the early '80s. It looks like the USAC years they used the 2.6 mile layout, and then the cart years they used the 3.3 mile layout so i guess they made a change when the faster cars came back there but uh any you know specific or interesting indie car anecdotes from the six riverside races um there were only six of them you know dan gurney won the first two Uh, i forget who won the third the three cart races rick mears uh ruled the first two and then ray bobby ray hall won the last indie car race uh at Riverside, um, but interestingly enough, you know, Mears has a reputation as a oval specialist. But what a lot of folks don't realize in the early part of, of, of Rick's career, he was one of the best on road courses. He really was. And, you know, after he had the, that horrible accident in, in San Air up in, in Canada, where he, he nearly lost both his feet, it, it made the, the road courses a bit more difficult for him you know, he kind of excelled a little more on the ovals, but uh, in in the in Rick's early days, he was he was a beast on road courses. You know, he he not only won at Riverside, you know, he wiped up the field, 
but a lot, a lot of people, they don't remember that. They, they remember Rick as the, the Oval Meister, the master of Indianapolis, but early in Rick's career. And Rick came out of the SCCA. He's an old Formula V guy. You know, he, he, he cut his teeth running road courses. So, um, you know, to, uh, to kind of cornhole him into being an Oval specialist is not doing real justice to his early career. But uh, those are some fine wins for, for Rick at, uh, at Riverside back in the early 80s, 81 and 82, that was. Yeah, honestly, I did not really know that beforehand. So uh, look at that, some Rick Mears knowledge in a Riverside International Raceway episode. So yeah, as I mentioned, you know, there was only six races. Dan Gurney won two, Rick Mears won two. Uh, some guy, Mario Andretti, won one. And then Bobby Rahal won the final one at the end of 1983. It's also a Formula One race that I, I think I mentioned at the beginning. They yeah, used... yeah, 1960, um, they they were trying to get a, a, a Grand Prix in the United States. I think in, in 58 or 59, they, they held one in Sebring. And then they, they went to Riverside for 1960. Sterling Moss won that Grand Prix there. And and then after that, Watkins Glen successfully bid to, to host the U.S. Grand Prix. And then it was held there from 1961 through 1980. So, but uh, yeah, Riverside did host, there was the, the, you know, Grand Prix of the United States in 1960, you know, points paying race for the championship. So, and, and speaking of championships, the, the, the races, the USAC races that were held at the Riverside were all the season enders, you know, again, due to the favorable weather in California, those races were held in early December, December 1st or 2nd uh, for the, the USAC races. And for a long time, the, um, final race of the season for NASCAR was at Riverside with their championship deciding race. You know, I mean, believe it or not, if you, if you think about NASCAR today, this day and age, how it's so strong and oval series and how we try to get a really neutral track for the championship four format, whatever, you know, you want to call it now uh, that they used to decide a championship on a road course back in the day. And then prior to 1982 or 83, uh, Riverside was was sometimes the season opener for NASCAR. Again, due to the favorable weather there in February, it would it would be before the Daytona 500. It wasn't until the 80s that the Daytona 500 began to to open open the year for NASCAR. So uh, little little bits of Riverside history where it was you know not just it was not just another race on the calendar. It was it was a very important race on the calendar for these different series. Now, again, we really haven't touched on sports cars a lot, but the LA, LA Times Grand Prix was a sports car race, and that was the signature event. Now, sports cars were wildly popular in the, in the 70s, sports cars and Can-Am racing, and this, this stuff back then was, it was more popular than stock car racing or open wheel racing. They, they would have great races there at Riverside, huge crowds. Um, then later during the MC years, they they changed that to an endurance race. It was a six hour, uh, but that was always their signature race, the LA Times Grand Prix. And these sports car races, you'd have guys like you know Andretti in there, you know Foyt. You're talking the, the Ken Miles and the Carroll Shelby's and, and all, all all these Jackie Eeks, you know all these guys that uh, you're used to seeing at Le Mans and and whatnot, and you know even guys like uh, Jackie Stewart and, and Graham Hill hopping these sports cars here and then. So um, that was really, yeah, you know, it, it 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 blows my mind today how sports car racing has taken like almost you know a fourth seat behind you know Formula One, NASCAR, IndyCar. No, it's disappointing. And it's disappointing, but NASCAR race or NASCAR sports car racing was hugely popular uh, during Riverside's heyday, and that was that was their marquee event. That was their that was their money maker. Yeah, I would have loved to see you know the the old IMSA cars there. Out of sheer curiosity, I'm looking at the race results. The years uh, Sterling Moss won in Formula One, it has the length listed at five point two seven one. Oh, you know why? That's because it's kilometers. kilometers. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this whole that whole European numbers thing is really confusing I me. Mean, we're gonna leave that in the episode because that was uh, <laughs> that was user error. Irock raced here, uh, raced at here, raced in Riverside for many years. Many years, yeah. The first the first season of of Irock, I believe, was in '74, and uh, the uh, Riverside was one of the um, the Irock races. So I want to say Mark Donahue won the 
first Iraq race right. on the yep. side, if I'm not mistaken, yeah. Yeah, he won twice there. Uh, Mario won, Bobby Unser won. Let's see, I'm trying to pick out some other IndyCar names. Scott Pruitt won in 88, which was the last IROC year. And then uh, Emerson Fittipaldi won 1975. Yeah, so there were some there were some huge winners even in the in the IROC series uh, that were open wheel related. Yeah, I mean IROCs are another series I kind of miss. You know, there was uh, you know back in the you know 70s 80s it was pretty cool. They used to they, uh, the first year they had it, everyone had a Porsche Carrera. You know, then they they you know went to the Camaros or whatever, and they they kind of sanitized it and and uh, you know in the in the later years of IROC they made it favor the nascar guys because of the type of car but but early on it was more of a sports car than than a stock car in iraq but that's that's another neat series that's just you know gone and lost to us yeah i i definitely i mean i remember watching the iraq series growing up and uh, i did not know until just now that it used to be well the first couple years were a, a porsche series which sounds amazing oh yeah much better than the you know iraq camaro they had in the in the 90s so yeah so we will uh wrap this up here with kind of you know how we typically wrap these up the downfall of riverside uh was it the typical land became more valuable elsewhere sort of issue well that's exactly what the issue was yep these housing developments started popping up around and then they uh uh, you know, uh, Ed Pauly and Les Richter got out. Um, they sold the track to a, a guy named Fritz Duda, who was a racing guy and had every intention of continuing racing. You know, people were, were kind of glad that they sold it to Fritz rather than selling it to land developers. But Fritz tried to hold on for a while. He, he purchased the track in 1983. Um, by, by 1988, it was apparent that, that number one, local opposition to the, the noise, right? as well as of course just, just the the urban sprawl and development coming around there that made it much more attractive to just go ahead and sell it and have them redevelop the property um and they started dismantling the track in 1989 the last uh last major event there was a nascar race um in uh, 1988 i believe ricky rudd was the winner uh, was the last major race there. They they did some club racing in 89, a few test sessions, but then they began dismantling the track. Uh, and it, it was a long process. Operations building actually stayed standing until, I believe, 2005, the administration building for the track. It was repurposed, but uh, that eventually went away. Um, the, the nice thing is that the, the housing development there's a shopping mall and several housing developments on the old property. The housing developments there, they've, in, in homage to the track, most of the streets in the developments are named after race car drivers. They're just like, and Andretti Lane, Gurney Way, Penske Street, Surtees Avenue, you know, Foyt Street, they're, they're all, uh, they've done that. And then, then they, they took most of the stuff from the administration building and a lot of the, the memorabilia from the track and there was a museum that stood for a while in, in you know in the riverside area and it was you know just you know just hey this is you know where the racetrack used to stand i've got all this stuff in the museum but eventually even the museum fell into financial trouble and the museum closed in 2012 so that literally there's i think as, as late as 94 95 you could still pick out turn nine and the back stretch on a map, but at now, 2019, there's literally nothing left uh, other than other than memories and old film. And and I, I don't know what what's happened to the museum collection. I, I hope that I know somebody is is tending to that, but it would be nice if somebody would kind of jump in and, and see if we can get that stuff on display somewhere, you know, maybe, maybe in the Indianapolis, you know, museum or maybe in the NASCAR hall of fame museum. But, but I believe that collection needs to go somewhere instead of in storage. Yeah. I, uh, I would love to see what they had there. The only, so for those who are near LA and, and possibly are curious about driving by to check this out, the handy research I've done here says that on Day Street, there is a Lowe's warehouse where the old Turn 9 used to be. So that is your, uh, go check out the, the Lowe's there, and uh, we can we can say that it was uh, Riverside International Raceway. So 
with that, we'll wrap up uh, another episode here with Riverside. I hope everybody enjoyed one that was not local to the Pennsylvania, New Jersey area. Frank and I will be back to do another one of these uh, at some point in the near future. Frank, thank you very much for joining me and have a good evening, my friend. Oh, thank you so much. I really appreciate uh, you having me on here again. I just, I really enjoyed doing these. So uh, I, I, pre- I appreciate you including me always. Yeah, no problem. And I uh, hope everybody enjoyed it and uh, we'll be back again soon.